Thank you. I wanted to say that I added the, um, uh, to the title, From Here to There, I Need a Hand, based on a quote from one of the families that I will be focusing the presentation on. So I want to give credit uh, to her. I worked as an infant development consultant for, for several years and then as a resource teacher here in the Lower Mainland, always working with children with identified or suspected special needs in my different roles. And uh, I always had like one stage of what was happening. So first with the IDP, Infant Development Program, obviously I was seeing the little ones. Then they get uh, discharged at age three, and then they go to other programs. As a resource teacher, I would see them at age five. I worked in the primary and uh, intermediate, some high school as well. So I always have like snippets of what was going on, but I knew that the stories had a, a, a fuller length to, to it. And once I had the opportunity to do uh, my dissertation, this is where I wanted to go. I, this was the motivation to, to learn more about the, the, what had happened to uh, these children and families. And um, this is the reference to uh, my dissertation and also a manuscript under review. So what happens to families when life take a twist and whatever they were expecting you know, to, to, to live with their children changes for them suddenly and the path, you know, that they thought they were going to um, go changes. And how do they manage through the different obstacles, the roadblocks, the different challenges, just like any other families, but with something more added to it. And um, I found many, many authors have found uh, different issues that parents confronted in raising uh, their, their children. Um, these um, studies were basically uh, of quantitative, uh, using quantitative methodology, and they had examined issues like assessment, atypical development, how do parents confront the different issues, uh, even access to programs. I wanted to take a closer look in a more personal way, so I went to uh, qualitative um, tradition. And my objective was to learn about the experiences of parents with children identified as, a, as at risk for developmental delays or with developmental disabilities as they transition from early intervention and into school programs. And these are some of the authors I consulted. And in doing so, I was inspired um, by McCollum's, uh, one of McCollum's um, uh, studies where she challenged the effectiveness of early intervention uh, programs that parents were receiving and with children with different uh, a variety of conditions. So what she said is, what is it that works in early intervention? We know it works for parents, but what is it that works? So in thinking about um, looking at uh, parents' experiences, this is what led me to, to find out more about what, what, what was happening with these parents and their children. So what are the individual experiences of parents of developmentally at risk children and their families who participated in the infant development program of British Columbia in terms of their access to resources and programs and their child's uh, or children's current developmental needs and how do these relate to the current preschool and demands on these parents, to the demands from other family members and to financial and work uh, pressure. So having a, um, an overview. I mentioned the Infant Development Program of British Columbia because that was one of the um, criteria for inclusion was that the families would have received uh, early intervention services through the IDP of BC and uh, they would have been either in the process of discharge or already discharged because I wanted to see kids who had already left the program and were about a little bit uh, further on the road. And uh, I will talk about the levels of services that these children uh, received, but you can see that the, the program offers uh, different levels of services, home base and in-center, and uh, it's based on the family center principles that are endorsed by authors like uh, 
uh, Carl Dons and Dons and, and Trivet. The whole recruitment process for the families happened through the IDP of BC through their provincial advisory office, which was closed uh, in 2008. So this changed a little bit um, the whole scene for the individual programs. Um, about the study, it's, uh, I conceived it as an ethnography, uh, participatory research. Uh, I went back and forth working with the community so that uh, the families would be reached on their terms. And it was a very, very positive process to, to do it this way. And uh, I looked at this experience of um, 11 parents in six families with infants and children around between three and eight years old at the time of, of data collection. And my uh, stance, my epistemological stance, was that um, coming from post-positivism, where I was, uh, I was uh, approaching their reality as I, as I learned from them in their questions. So um, I wanted to um, provide an overview of all the children, but you will notice that I have highlighted in uh, green and blue the two children that I am focusing today with their parents. And for now, these are child A and child A, B in family three, but I will add names as their voices come, out, come through. So there were, in the end, two girls and five boys in two different stages of, of data collection. And the children uh, had a variety of conditions and diagnosis. Uh, and our two um, children of interest for today, uh, one had the older uh, child, child A, mom suspected the delays from the beginning, and his involvement was moderate. Child B was diagnosed at risk since birth, and uh, he was uh, the, um, identified with uh, severe difficulties. Out of the 11 parents uh, in the families, um, nine parents took part, and today we are concentrated on um, what I call right now Mother 3. Her name is Rosario, and or I have given her this name for this presentation, with the two children. I just wanted you to look at the different um, cultural and linguistic backgrounds that these uh, families had, although they all identified as Canadian, even if they were immigrants, they were Canadian, and they all spoke and understood English. So the children, uh, the way I reached their information was through the, their file reviews through the IDP, but for the parents, I uh, conducted four to five interviews, and we had two focus groups. A little bit more about the families. I wanted to, I have some information um, to, to have a bit of uh, background. And our family of interest, uh, so Rosario with her husband and the two children, only Rosario participated in the interviews, but hus husband was mentioned all the time. And there were the two children, were ch child A, his name is Peter, is the older brother. They have post-secondary education, both parents, university. They um, are both holding part-time jobs through a home-based business to help each other and uh, own their home just like everyone except for one of the families, family six, where there was a grandmother uh, with a, a little one in, uh, in care, permanent care. She was for permanent. And they all lived in um, apartments of, uh, uh, or duplex. This family lived in a duplex, all but family six who is this grandmother on their homes. And then, really quickly, um, a, an overview of the different families and then focusing on the family that we're um, interested more today. The children in the families one, two, three, and four were home visited. This is one of the levels of service from the IDP. And the other two were seen in center as I go by. Um, I will focus more on this child who is Peter. Child A, he's in the gray area. He's the only child who did not have a suspected, uh, sorry, a confirmed condition who was actually seen at, at home because of the circumstances. Again, family five and six, they attended uh, a wait list or a monitoring group in the infant development program. 
and uh, they were both at risk uh, for different circumstances. One, because of complications at birth, and then rehospitalizations, and then the other one because of um, um, risk for alcohol and drug consumption during mom's pregnancy. But at the time of the recollection, they had were both attending uh, preschool and with transitioning to kindergarten, and uh, they, they had no uh, referrals to any other services like supported child development or any other of those. So now, um, th this next part of the presentation, I would like to talk a little bit more about the details on Family 3. And I have this picture because this is, uh, in listening to, to Rosario speak, the life of, you know, the, the, the many, the highway with the two lanes and the tunnels coming in and out as she looks for services, as she's trying to uh, figure out what's happening with her two children at the same time was um, very, very challenging. And the destination was, as most parents will always say, you know, the access, access to services. One slight summary this is what is happening for this family. So Rosario is a young mom uh, who came as a, as, a, as a student and then stayed and got married, was an immigrant, bilingual. She speaks uh, English and another language. And um, she has everybody away in uh, their country, but her sister came at a certain point and stayed with them and, and helped out. She has help from her uh, in-laws. I say this because um, the other families did not have this help, and only family two, who, who had a very involved child, had like built-in grandparents to help any time they needed. And this was the only family who, that, where the parents could hold two full-time jobs. Everybody else, they couldn't, just because they were juggling, and even more this, this family. And then Logan is a younger child, and I start with him because he is the one who brought services for his brother. And we will see how this happened. And the way I learned this was about um, the information was through the file reviews in the IDP files that I got permission to go over. So these are the children's files in the Infant Development Program of BC. These are the categories that I was able to isolate according to the organization of these files. And when I say file reviews, they are, this, is, this is manual. This is, you know, printed files. IDP has started a process of digitalization, and, and they have now a great database um, up, up to today. All the files, uh, you know, were, were printed, and this was the first time that someone had actually come from the outside and do file reviews and, and look, at, look at all the information. So here is Logan. His mom had a healthy pregnancy, but he was born early with intrauterine growth retardation. So he, wasn't, he didn't have the size and the weight he needed to have by 37 weeks. He was very, very low, almost very low birth weight, and he had complications. And um, what I show here on, the, on these slides is what I learned from the file reviews, right? And then I came back and checked with mom, okay, listen, this was on the file. Did you agree with this? Was this information uh, accurately entered? And, and, and she added, she always had something to add. And then I also mentioned here the member checks, which is when I finished the interviews and the mom read through all the transcript, she was able to, to tell me, yes, add this, take this out. But in general, she's, she was fine with all information. This is called triangulation of the data and then with the member checks. And um, this child had a lot of medical complications. Uh, this condition, torticoli, is a genetic condition that both children had. And I didn't know, but it's a condition that really affects the muscles. Well, I, I, I know torticoli because in Spanish it's the same thing. You cannot, uh, you know, turn your, your neck. But it's beyond uh, a temporary pain. It's something that really alters your movement of your neck and shoulders. And uh, if it appears early in life, it's genetic. They didn't know this at the beginning. And um, so, so this child ended up seeing different specialists related all in the end to this condition. 
and the fact that he also had seizures, apparently that this was also related to a, meta- it's a metabolic condition related to this genetic condition. Um, anyways, by age um, three, he was already receiving f- uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy. The occupational was private, not um, not not uh, funded through the other center where they were receiving physiotherapy center. He had ABA support, and he had already a referral um, by between ages three and four to preschool with uh, special needs support. So. It was, it, was, it was clear. One interesting thing is that he had started on target with his motor development, and then it deteriorated by age two. And the physiotherapy assessment, you know, said, no, this child, you know, and this is, this is why they started this whole assessment process about, you know, what is the scoliosis, what is the torticoli, is this all related? Then we go to Peter. And Peter is the older brother. He was born at 39 weeks. In the files, there were no mention to complications. However, when we did the file revisions, mom said no. It was a very prolonged birth uh, labor process, and he was put into a heart monitoring, and it ended up being a C-section. He was very prone to colds as an infant, and he was hospitalized several times because of uh, respiratory infections. But Immediately, like by the second term of life, a mom noticed that there was something off with uh, speech and with uh, language. And uh, the consultant confirms all of this in the, in the file reviews, saying also, you know, difficulties with behavior, preservative, uh, and, uh, and uh, in, in play, and overactive. And uh, so he received visits between the second year of life, and remember IDP goes on to the end of the third year of life, and almost four years old, whereas his brother had been seen immediately. Like the referral came through at two months, and at four months he had started. And um, the, Peter received uh, speech and language uh, therapy in collaboration, working in collaboration with the IDP consultant. And what they noticed is that uh, as he uh, grew older, the gap between receptive and expressive uh, kept uh, um, uh, how do you say increasing, and uh, and um, and. He couldn't hold a conversation, and his functional language was very, very poor. So, the, he, you know, the recommendations were for further assessment and to continue speech language and preschool with special needs. At the time that I met uh, Mom, Peter was already uh, going to grade two, so he had already done that transition. So she's looking back at the years. So when you look back. In addition to working with uh, their IDP consultant twice a week, once for each child because they received different visitations, this family had ongoing uh, consultations, and that's why I have the maze of the, of the highway. At least five medical specialists, at least three therapists, and the psychologists. The specialists were more related to uh, Logan, the, the younger one, and because he had more medical complications than Peter. But this was ongoing, and... Uh, uh, the rest of the participant parents reported similar experiences of multiple consultations during this period of time. I wanted to quickly connect because we are um, conducting a population-based study of uh, children in BC and following on their health uh, trajectories and later on linking with their educational trajectories. And uh, what we're seeing is that indeed uh, NICU uh, children who had been in a neonatal and intensive care unit uh, for a prolonged time uh, by in the, you know, the first year of life and up to age three, they are re-hospitalized twice as much as their non-NICU counterparts. Then that sort of goes down and then that peaks again with access to different specialists. So no hospitalized anymore, but uh, requiring different specialists, not only pediatrics, but uh, neurologists, psychiatrists, uh, it's physio- for psychotherapy for the family. So it's really interesting to start connecting this to the, to the larger uh, population in BC and, and listening to the stories of parents, which we're also listening right now in the project I'm involved with. So um, moving on to what I learned from uh, Rosario and during the interviews and focus groups, 
I just wanted to give a brief overview about the topics that we covered. They were open-ended and semi-structured, so they lasted about an hour each, and we sort of divided them by topics from the early years to transition from IDP to preschool to then school, and then anything that they wanted to add about uh, their family and whatever what ha was happening at the time. So uh, I just divided um, Rosario's life's events. This is, this is mom and that I introduced before. And when I say prior to that data collection, it's prior to what we discussed really during the data collection. So this was information that came, you know, uh, in and out of the conversation. And um, one thing that she, that she really uh, said is that uh, through the, the whole process of becoming aware of what were uh, Peter's needs and then Logan's needs, she became very, very empowered uh, to, to advocate for her son. And the consultant has in her file, this mom is like on top and ahead and beyond everything. And, and I said, do you agree with what the consultant says? Oh, yeah, I perceive myself like this. I am on top of everything, and I am, I'm going ahead with this. And she felt very strong about it. So I am going to go now. I'm going to take time so you listen to Rosario's voice and not my interpretation. But I wanted to first provide like a quick summary. What Rosario wants other parents to know is that this is her message directly, is that they should access services early enough as opposed to being asked to wait and see from the position, which is what she got over and over. And very frustrated because her second child, Logan, met the risk criteria and hence was immediately referred for services. And this is why she was able to flash her older son, who... Uh, she, whom she had already identified as someone who needed help from very early on. I have a series of about eight slides, I think, and we'll, we can stop at any time, uh, where this is Rosario talking uh, about her whole process of uh, early intervention. So I'm going to read as if it was her. I guess I'll start... It's I'll start, but she says, I guess I'll start on by talking what's the IDP all about. When my son was four months, I was so worried something wasn't right with my son. He was not, you know, talking. I didn't know who to go. I know something is not right. Well, the doctor would say, oh, he's fine. He would say that, you know, and it didn't happen until when my other son was born. Well, I already had a concern with my older son. I didn't edit her talking. This is the way she talks. And then my younger son, he was born really, 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 really small, like almost three pounds. And I guess because it was with a community nurse and part of what the community nurse was doing was to ask about the sibling. And then we told her we had a concern with the all, older sibling. And they said, why don't the two of you, you have got the two kids, why don't you bring them to the IDP? Because the son was low birth weight, he was asthmatic, then he, he met the criteria. And my older son, he's healthy over eight pounds, and no one, nobody referred him through the IDP. So really, she makes a point here about the weight criteria that we keep getting over and over about referrals. It's always about low birth, birth weight and prematurity, which is a sound criteria we know, but it's not the only one. But somehow the medical profession is, um, th this is, you know, if, if the child is, is big and strong, like that baby was, who, who was also developing well, you know, why do you worry? My husband and I went to the IDP and told them that my baby, he's a younger one, Logan, we don't know if there's anything wrong with him by now. He's only six months. But we have a concerns about our older child, Peter. Everything got rolling, and then the IDP did the referrals, and we got assigned for therapy, and we got play therapy. After that, the ball got started, and IDP helped us a lot, and our consultant was so good with our son, Peter. She told us what to do, where to go, and then we found out about the Parent Child Mother Goose Program. This is a program where parents and children do rhymes together, and there, there's many around the, the city and the province. It's a provincial program. It's free. And there was one in the, at the IDP site where these parents were attending. And then you found that you were not in a situation where you were not alone, all by yourself. Then we would get together and kids would do their things. 
thing. Later, we found out that our younger son has also problems, and IDP took uh, over again, and we got help. So she's talking here about assessment. And what I wanted to mention is that it's not that she had not been, she had been oblivious about the needs of the, the little one. It's just that she was so concerned that he wouldn't live. At the beginning, he was so sick that her whole focus one was, okay, this baby needs, you know, the survival of the baby, right? And knowing that the other child is growing and he's having difficulties and no one is paying attention to she has to say. So if you can imagine her her situation, right? My older son, Peter, and I went to the doctor, and Peter didn't smile. You know, he is still in the autism spectrum, like he's still these days, right? He, she, she went back and forth, right? He was eight now. He's still in the autism spectrum. We wouldn't have known anything about that without IDP because our consultant helped us a lot. She asked us to see the doctor, and the doctor would say, wait, and our consultant would say, why don't you go and see to this doctor? And she recommended us a different doctor. This doctor she knows that would help. I go to my doctor and say, can you recommend me to this doctor? And she says, and how do you know about that doctor? <laughs> so there's always this a, a sensation from her that she had to prove herself that she needed a professional because whatever she was saying was not good enough. Even the doctor says, how do you know about this doctor? For Peter, do this, tell your doctor to make referral to the provincial center. This is the consultant prepping her. I didn't even know about this center at this time. And then we got there for the assessment and our consultant came to the meeting. If not for her, my son would not be diagnosed. And then nothing would have happened. We've not had any help because they said, I think it's just, it's just language delay. But consultants say, wait a minute, you forgot this and this and that. Because you know, one would go to hospital, this is the center, and the, the doctor would look at our son Peter, and it's only for him, the doctor, a few hours. But our consultant worked with my son for two years, forever. So she's more the expert. So because our consultant is more a professional, now she's listened, the doctor said, Peter, maybe we give him a provisional diagnosis. This is at the provincial center. And that got me the funding. And our consultant said to me, it's just a label. So what Rosario learned is if they say your child is autistic, even better here because you can get help. You know, you have a child who has a delay, you don't get help. Unfortunately, help depends on the label. So there we go. We just got the label. And now if you see my son, he's night and day. If you compare him to like other kids that she has been seeing him uh, around, our consultant helped him to do that. And of course, with my other son, our consultant helped him too. So when she says that he's night and day now, is that uh, she was a very, very engaged and active mom. And she had sort of rounded about a network of moms uh, through the consultant who had said, you know, you can connect with other parents who are going through similar situations. So she had all these friends. And then she found all of this electronic, you know, software and stuff. So... In that process, she got this Reading Rockets uh, program, and the child learned to talk, and he said, bubble. But then they discovered he was hyperlexic. And she's like, what's hyperlexic? So the child was talking, but that's the problem with the language that had no meaning, right? So, or he didn't, you know, uh, know exactly what the, the meaning was. And because of the experience of other families, especially for some families who can hardly speak English, now she talks to about her recommendations as she finishes her, or, or I finish with the quotes for her contributions. Maybe they have children, maybe like my children, and don't know what to do. They go and get a diagnosis, but they wouldn't know what to do after that because the provincial center just said, Peter, your son has autistic disorder, but who do you go to next? Perhaps they could talk to the parents and tell them what to do next. So this was her experience, and uh, again, this would have been now around eight years ago, because, uh, yes, or even a little bit more, yeah, around eight years so ago. So this is sort of the end of focusing on this section on Family 3 and Logan and Peter, and I would now uh, like to um, weave the journey from Rosario and share a few examples on uh, the experiences 
and how they connect with uh, other parents. So her ch two children did get the diagnosis with ASD, and Peter kept the diagnosis when he was again seen. And um, if we look at the different themes that emerged, I did an across and within analysis of the different themes that emerged. So I look at them across the different families and then sort of look at special issues within each family. And sort of the within analysis sort of came through with my comments when I was talking about Rosario's experiences. So to address, you know, what is it that works in early intervention, the theme that came uh, as prominent was family center approach and home visitation services. And what it, what it, what it is, uh, what it refers to is that the parent knowledge of their children is what leads the early intervention family center practices. So when they are asked, okay, what is it that works for you? You know, what is it that you need? This is where it's successful. This is, I'm speaking on behalf of all the parents that I'm summarizing now the information. And when their needs are ignored, ignored, it reduces the chances for parents to move ahead. I have, I love this quote from Ingrid, who is a mother of five, uh, and she had a little one um, who, who was very sick, and then he, he did fine, but he had medical complications. And when she says, I am not going anywhere where they tell me that my kid is this and that, and it's not that she didn't want to have her child assessed or a diagnosis if needed, but she was tired that she went from one doctor to the other, and they would look at him for five minutes, and they said, oh, he's going to be like this, or he's this, or he's that, you know, and, you know, different diagnosis, and in the end, she was so frustrated. So um, you will see later on what they say when they um, get to the IDP. The things two and three is one-to-one -one relationship with the consultant or the therapist and the inclusion of all the other family members in the process of consultation. And uh, this is, you know, what hand-holding looks like for Rosario. Um, she described her, uh, she and others, but I'm speaking for her right now, uh, play a unique role and develop very special relationships at a very fragile time in this parent's life. It's the first three years of the child's life. And they support them in their awareness of their children's developmental needs and their timely referrals for early intervention uh, services. And they do it in such a way that if there is a grandma visiting, if the, the aunt is, is, you know, with them, you know, whoever is part of the family is there helping now some, somehow, or, you know, they are included in the process. However, this, may, this whole hand-holding may be lost when the IDP uh, program ends for parents at uh, age three or by the time of the child is going to turn four, depending on the situation of the child. And if not, if it continues because the child has a supported child development program, for example, or any other um, program that is involved with them at a family basis, the kindergarten entries, the other drop down, and, and, and many people have talked about this many, many times. And one of the things that, that came over and over is that because of the medical system that uses very strict medical uh, criteria, criteria, the children in the gray area, like Peter, are lost. And this is, this is the awareness that we're trying to, to bring about. And um, the next uh, two themes were uh, four and five, collaborative consultation and effective knowledge translation in sharing information and resources. So the, in the journey towards uh, accessing, towards the destination of services, like how do we access services? So what parents are, are sharing is that when these conditions of family center uh, practices do take place, this ensure that there is a true collaboration where there, are joined, there is a joint decision uh, a process in place and the information is back and forth. Uh, for example, and, yeah, Rosario was very proud with this example of the reading rockets and you know because the consultant didn't know about this program but I tell her and look it works. So maybe the program is not good for all the kids, maybe it's not the program that you want to be using all the time but it worked for her and she felt great that she could add something and learn something in, in, in the process. Um, a theme, uh, sorry, uh, um, it, it, was, it was a theme at the end, but an issue that came over and over is that parents want the information made explicit. Many times 
you know, parents say, you know, like they're talking to me in a language, not only in a language but that I can understand, but they're talking to me about a context, referring to a context that I don't have. So the more explicit and clear for them, it also helps them to be explicit. And I have a little bit more of this for the discussion. The information sharing and knowledge translation um, it, it was illustrated a little bit through um, John and Ingrid, the, the, the mom who said, I'm not taking my kids to this place. Uh, John was saying, it was very different once we were at the IDP. It was pretty comfortable and pretty casual. And then mom asks, this is a conversation they're having uh, during the interview. I interviewed the two of them together. Um, we did not understand it could be this, it could be that. This is way back uh, with a medical um, uh, situation. Now with the IDP, we could do our own assessment. And what she's talking about is the ages and stages questionnaires because uh, they were able to fill in the questionnaires with the consultant, then follow on with the physiotherapist. And in their case, they also follow up with a speech language therapist, although this child didn't have any, any other concerns uh, later on. And then the last two themes, six and seven, case managing and service coordination and tr stressors that become barriers and uh, sort of combine them here because when the transition between services is planned in this way where the parents know where they're going next and who are they going to be working with and what is following, then it sort of provides the opportunity for a centralized early childhood education and early intervention service and case managing coordination. But when it doesn't happen, which is what parents found out in, 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 in their case, it, the, the ongoing stress that they, that they experience uh, becomes, you know, like their own barrier to, to, to follow through. So even if they have information, okay, where I need to go next, if there, if there isn't someone there saying, yes, come, come here, we are ready for you, and this is the best way to do it, then this is when they, when they miss uh, even meetings, appointments, and people say, oh, they are not interested. Uh, really, it's more related to, to that situation. And um, I have a couple of examples with this sense of loss that continues anytime you have a child who is uh, so, you know, suffering a, a risk condition or, or a diagnosis and the anxiety. Um, so Rosario, this is where her full quote is. She says, from here to there, I cannot jump like that. I need to be handheld during the transition. And I want to stress that these were very creative, resilient, energetic, resource, resourceful parents. So when they share this, it, this is what they're going through. They're not like whining and complaining. Not once anyone, you know, whine and complain, which they were for me very entitled to do. But this is, you know, this is what I need. And um, in the absence of this uh, whole picture coordination, accessing programs and services becomes stressful and ineffective, and they lose precious time, which is the resentment that um, Rosario was carrying through. Um, they resonate with other parents uh, who also um, uh, express a desire of, to, to have this uh, support. Father one and Anna, so Jim and Anna have this little girl with a con condition detected prenatally, and then when she was born, many other complications surfaced. Physically, she looked fine, but uh, she was she she had physical and social and emotional uh, needs. So one gets tired of being told you have to work with less. This means writing letters, accessing people, tiring, frustrating. He was a bureaucrat, so he was experiencing this at work and then at home because for everything for his daughter he needed to do. For Anna, she expressed it very simply, you have a feeling you have been dropped. And uh, this is something other parents echo. For May, who had a child with a profound disability, physical, uh, uh, physical and uh, cognitive, and in, in, in every aspect, and her health was very frail. She kept saying, we need a chart showing how the system and services work, and you'll see the continuation of that. And for grandmother six, who was taking care of this boy who was so bright, but with that fear that the alcohol and drugs during pregnancy would show their effect later on, and she's waiting. So I just want to make sure that there is nothing else, because when they are like this, little like this, it is the time to catch things.
So, for example, it's about juggling family, work, and finances when after all the drama, life goes on, uh, or the initial uh, crisis, not, not just the, the drama. Uh, so the, what, what was very clear was the complexity of issues and logistics in participant families. And many families said, we know that you know, families with young kids go through all of these things. It's just that they happen at the same time, and they continue. You know, it's not that this, this is not just a stage. It's goes on. So you're talking about health risk and disability, child care availability that is specialized in the family's job and in financial conditions. So to continue with mother two, she says once she goes to school, they are not going to carry her around. The child is not walking at age six because she waited until six. Yes, this is reality and we got to think into the future. But for six years, she was so concerned with everything else the f- to accept that the child is not going to walk, you know, it only lands on her when she says she cannot have a stroller at the school. She needs a wheelchair, right? And for mother and father four who had had a, a little one with Down syndrome, very sick, very frail, mother four says he was just tiny. He was very sick with pneumonia and being on oxygen. Even at home, he was on oxygen. They kept che- checking on us. The IDP pro- protected me from panicking. So the role of the consultant was, like she says, like an angel who would come, like flutter around and say, is everything okay? You know, what do you need? What information? Right? And then the father says, for three months, I only slept for an average of three hours a night, checking on the baby so he wouldn't stop breathing and checking on the mom so she wouldn't collapse. And they have another daughter. So uh, by February, it creeps on you. It's a dark month, right? I went to my director at work and said, I can't keep this up. I took time off for seven months, and that's what changed everything. Of course, everything changed for the better for the family logistics, but imagine the impact financial, right? They have, you know, the two kids. Um, Just in closing down all of this interpretation, something that kept coming back was these themes of cycles of disability and anticipation and the parenting over a long time. Um, so these are more sorry sub, sub, sub themes to to the to the to the to the last couple of themes. So Rosario says, you know, she speaks another language. She cannot speak that language with her kids, and says, you know, for Peter, I like to speak my language. It's so hard, and she just you know cried. And being a um, second language speaker, English is my second language. Just to imagine that I cannot teach my language to my children, that would have broken my heart. And with the little one, he was so delayed with his language that she wasn't even thinking about it. With mother too, her realization is that we did not know at this stage she would not be walking. She has all the signs there, but the dealing with all the medical condition of the child is like, okay, she's six and now she's not walking. With grandmother six, the anxiety, one does not know what comes at the turn of the bend, you know, like what happens, you know, when he learns to read, what happens, you know, is he going to be hyperactive, is he going to be behavior? Her two, her, so her son's dad and her other son had mental health and addiction issues. Is he going to be addicted to, right? All of these things. For father one, his nervousness, she's going to school now and this kid has the potential for a thousand conditions. What's the next complication that's going to come? So... I just wanted to have the combination of fathers, mothers, and the grandmother because they all report to the different stressors, and some of them are very explicit, but this one is less, it is more implicit. And so father four, you know, he said before, I took time off and now it changed everything. And, and then he was gradually going back to work. So he says, the way we look at our schedule, there is a three-hour break for each person each day. Right now, no one can do time on your own. But with this system, I think the pressure is off. Well, talk to me in a few weeks. So they were always trying to, you know, uh, juggle things with, uh, with, uh, with all of the, the two children and the different programs, the different therapies. The, and, and between the two of them, they held uh, two, four part-time jobs because, you know, he worked in something, you know, carpentry at night and during the day he was at his regular work, his mom did jewelry at night, you know, things like this. So this multiple case study approach uh, within the ethnographic tradition really provided a lot of um, very sound, solid, and deep information. And uh, of course there were limitations because the families were in 
uh, selected in only one program, and IDP has programs all over the, the province, and it was a large urban center. So the first thing after, you know, as a thesis, uh, the dissertation was ending, is that, you know, BC is huge and diverse. You Already know? just uh, because of our project, including all children and families, expanding partnerships, has taken all to, to very different diverse communities in the interior and in the north, smaller urban, rural and remote. We have already heard so much from parents and service providers about, you know, things don't work here this way. This this is different. You know, our Issues are more about, you know, like we need to drive, you know, two hours and then two hours back, you know, with kids peeing in the trunk and, you know, <laughs> without a place to stop, you know, and it's April and it's still snowing, you know, kind of thing, you know. So they may not have the same issues. Other issues are more universal, the, the more like the couples, families are more universal. The other thing is to add uh, a wider ethnocultural and educational background. This, this, this group of families is very homogeneous with all post-secondary education and they all spoke English. And even if they were struggling economically or financially, none of them was, for example, you know, receiving an income assistance. Uh, at the time of data collection, when I went to the member checks, one of the fathers, uh, Father Five, had had to close his home-based business because with all the complications, the, the, his partners had basically dropped him. And, you know, so that's the impact for them. It, it would be interesting to see other, other groups of, of children, uh, families. Immigrant and refugee families who have little or no spoken English also following Rosario's recommendation, you know, what do they do? You know, they, they, yes, there are translations available, but, you know, lost in translation, the whole navigation of the system. And then different family structures. We had two parent households, uh, both father and mother. What about other family structures? And, and uh, we also had a grandma who was a permanent caregiver, and, and, but she was the only one who was a little bit different, and uh, although there is enough information there to learn with her, with her own families. And uh, a wish of mine um, is to go back and talk to kids Talk to kids who have been in the IDP, who, who had uh, received any of these therapies as little, and then, you know, how is it for them, you know, lo looking back? Um, I have some uh, implications, practical implications, uh, and recommendations for health uh, professionals, and they refer to the importance of uh, specialized training in typical and atypical development. This has already, I know this, this is not a new thing to say, I'm just speaking on behalf of the parents and what, what I come through that this, this information reinforces uh, their concept of like waste no time, you know, time is precious. Any minute that you lose is is, is, is years, you know, and sometimes not recoverable anymore for our kids. And the expanding the referral criteria, criteria um, Simeons, Rune Simeonson and others really endorse this World Health Organization's International Functional Classification for Disability and Handicap Criteria because they, it's a system where you can, you, you, you rely both on the medical diagnosis but also on the description of, you know, how is the child doing, what are their abilities or skills and what are their needs. The only thing is that they don't start until age five. So it goes between five and 19. So we would skip, you know, the early years. But just to start moving along those lines, for early intervention professionals and family center practice, the academic and professional training is paramount. I brought some brochures just to illustrate where we started this online master's, but it's um, not, it's to, the, to enhance their skills and their uh, strategies so that parents can make informed decisions by uh, supporting them in their health and developmental literacy. So every time a consultant is working with a parent and explains in plain language but with accurate terminology, this is what's happening, this is what I'm doing, like my physiotherapist today says, I'm going to torture you today and you're going to do this balance, you're not going to die, <laughs> but this is what you need because if you don't do balance, even if you do strength, it's not going to be enough. So this is sort of the same message that you're getting from parents, this is what they, that they want. They love the home visitation services at least for the three years because it's safe for them and it's more relaxed, especially when they allow other like siblings or someone else to be in the consultation. Um, again, together with the health literacies is acknowledge their implicit concerns. So what do you mean? Can you elaborate a little bit more? 
did I hear you right? You can be very respectful because parents sometimes get a little bit on the defensive, but they didn't mind if they were probed, gently probed, because sometimes they don't know what to say, but they have this fear, right? And help on articulating specific explicit concern. And then the last twist is that consultants started to approach and saying, you know, what about us? You know, we are trying to work on this family center model or uh, approach, but look at all the challenges. So one of the studies that is coming out is uh, interviewing um, consultants with, um, in, in terms of, you know, what happens for them when they're going to deliver this family center approach and they deal with a medical model or more therapeutic system. So at the policy level, um, I, I uh, really heard from uh, the parents that this situation of only having uh, kids diagnosed or identified when they meet this specific criteria leaves out too many kids. And for every child that we know, how many more they are left out. So going back to this concept that has been, oh, so many centuries, uh, talked about the universal system of long-term screening and monitoring for all children where you can identify children at the time of birth and work along with families and in this collaborative model. And not everybody needs the same. So if you use something like the RTI, the response to intervention model, there are layers and levels of services where you can attend to everyone on an as-needed basis, but there is a plan. It's not left you know, in the air. And Hebeler has a great report that is online and about um, this. This is in the States, and they were trying to also recommend this universal system after they uh, interviewed many, many parent service providers and uh, assessed kids for the first five years. But Jane Pivik also had a full report for the Society for, no, Special Needs Alliance, Special Needs and Youth. Special Children with Special Needs Alliance. I forget the name right now. But it's a, it's a report in 2007 that is uh, available online. This is it. I have. Thank you. Alto.